asked by numerous people to do a video on my thoughts on soy and tofu products and their effect on your health, how much you should eat, if you should eat soy products. Um, there's a lot of controversy on this issue. I just found this really interesting article um, and I, I kind of wanted to summarize it for you guys. I think it's the most comprehensive article I found on the topic. It, it's a little bit confusing and I kind of just wanted to break it down a little bit and explain some things to you guys. Um, I will link the article in the down bar if you want to read it for yourself. All of the, the sources are cited in the article. Um, so I really trust the information. If you want to check any facts, um, the sources are listed on the article itself. Um, according to the article, they've been around for 5,000 years. Um, they're used in tofu, tempeh, and um, edamame beans. In Western diets, they are heavily processed and used in a lot of meat alternatives and a lot of cheese and dairy alternatives as well. So that's kind of where we see a lot of soy products. Um, hidden soy products, things you wouldn't think contain soy, um, a lot of things do, so that's that's why um, there's been a lot of concern about the amount of soy we are consuming in our diet and its health detriments to us. One of the key words you will see on any research into soy products is isoflavons. Isoflavons are, um, okay, this is, I am not a nutritionist, so this is just me kind of breaking it down a little bit as far as what I understand. Isoflavons are very high in soybean products, um, and this is the element of soy products that is supposed to have the most health benefits for us and has been studied in depth. The Nutrition Committee of the American Heart Association has assessed 22 random trials conducted since 1999 and found that isolated soy protein with isoflavons slightly decreased LDL cholesterol but had no effect on HDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol. Um, triglycerides and lipoprotein or blood pressure. The other effects of soy consumption were not evident. So if you're eating soy products thinking you're going to get a bunch of health benefits, I would reevaluate that thought. Um, the soy has been pushed as being a health food, like something that um, should supplement meat in your diet if you're switching to a vegan or plant-based diet, and I totally disagree with that. From all the research I've done into the topic, um, that is not the way soy products should be viewed or used. A lot of studies have said there's benefits to women with menopause, um, and what this article said is that Asian women report fewer problems with hot flashes and other menopausal symptoms than their American counterparts. Studies have found very little of any effect on hot flashes when soy was added to diets of postmenopausal women in the United States. And there's a lot of differences in um, Asian diets and Western diets, so um, I think that is why um, we're not seeing those kind of benefits. Because it's because of the kind of soy we're eating and the amounts we're eating it in. You have to remember that a lot of the pro-soy studies that are being done are funded by companies that stand to monetarily benefit from these studies and this research, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, they're very biased when they're making these studies. Um, many pro-soy studies are conducted and sponsored by companies with a vested interest in the success of soy, including the meatpacking company Carhill. So, and it's also kind of interesting that there's been such a push to show benefits of soy products since they've been genetically modified in some of these studies. Um, and it's also kind of interesting that there's been such a push to show benefits of soy products since they've been genetically modified by these companies. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Like, why are they pushing it since it's been around for 5,000 years? Why has there been such a push since it's been genetically modified to incorporate it into our diets and to try to find all these benefits for soy products? This is an excerpt from the article. It's also troubling to note that the author of this study, which was a pro-soy study, and several other recent studies claiming soy is not a danger to the thyroid is Mark Mencina, PhD. Mencina, though not a medical doctor, also goes by the name Dr. Soy. 
Mencina had been in charge of grant funding at the National Institutes of Health, where he oversaw a $3 million grant for soy studies. S soon after he left NIH, he was hired to serve on the scientific, scientific advisory boards of both the United Soybean Board and International Soy Agro agribusiness Archer Daniels Midland. He still serves on both scientific advisory boards as a paid advisor. In addition to his work on these advisory boards, Mencina is a consultant to the United Soybean Board and editor of its soy-related newsletter and serves as a paid speaker and consultant to promote the positive benefits of soy for the United Soybean Board Soy Connection. Mencina has also published a number of books promoting soy. The political Friendster website, which tracks corporate influences, has documented the close relationship between Mencina and the various corporate players in the soy industry. So there are links in that article if you want to read more about that. But that's why I want to, I want to say if you see a lot of articles um, touting the benefits of soy um, and their you have to check the source that it comes from. You have to make sure they're not connected to these industries that have something financially to gain from finding there's benefits to soy. And here's two examples of backtracking done on people that are being pro-soy, like the American Heart Association backtracked on its earlier support of soy and is now saying there is no evidence that soy has specific benefits for heart health or for lowering, lowering cholesterol. Research on the use of soy and isoflavones for cancer prevention is also inconclusive, and there is no evidence that soy can cause weight loss except as part of the simple equation of substituting a lower fat, lower calorie protein source for a fattier, fattier high calorie protein as part of a weight loss effort. And there was a letter done by two researchers, George and Sheehan, and they have refined their concerns. And it says from the article, in the journal Environmental Health Perspectives, it suggested that for soy to cause toxicity, there must be several factors, including iodine deficiency, defects of hormone synthesis, or additional goitrogens in the diet. You can hear it in the name goitrogens. Um, if you think of goitrogens, you can hear goiter, and goiter essentially is hyperthyroidism. I'm sorry if I'm having trouble with these terms. There's a lot of science that goes behind this research I've been doing. Um, and a lot of science in this article, which is why I really like it and want to encourage you guys to read it. I feel like it's not sensationalized. I feel like there's a lot of facts backing this stuff up. Really, the main people that need to be concerned about really limiting their soy or eliminating it from their diet are people that have iodine deficiencies and um, problems with th their thyroid. Um, and this is kind of a tricky area because a lot of people are undiagnosed with these problems. They don't know they have iodine deficiencies or um, thyroidism. I would say if you're having any health issues and you know it's just kind of smart to get a checkup from your doctor, maybe just ask if there's any tests they can do to test for iodine deficiency um, and thyroidism. So the best case scenario for people with those problems is just to completely avoid soy products if you can um, because they really do trigger thyroid problems and can even cause them, um, especially they found this to be true when um, people were substituting um, human milk for soy milk for in baby formulas. A lot of those children, I think it was a study done in 1992, a lot of those children ended up getting hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism. so you have to be careful about that. Never, ever, ever, ever um, feed your baby a soy infant formula unless you talk to your doctor about it. I think there's some formulas now that don't contain any isoflavones. I think they've like, found some kind of soy-based formulas that don't do that. But again, you need to be very careful about what you feed your child. Um, there's been a lot of cases where people were being kind of ignorant on the subject um, and their children have suffered from the vegan diet and that is because their parents were not feeding them the appropriate foods and soy food should definitely be limited or eliminated from very young diets. I, I think that that's just a really safe precaution to take. If you do find it necessary to include soy in your diet, which it is kind of hard to avoid, it's in a lot of um, dairy substitutes, meat substitutes, and that's why I've always said you need to limit that stuff and you need to um, make your own faux meats. Really the only processed soy products I eat are like faux cheeses and um, 
like faux sour cream, that kind of stuff. And I only eat those maybe once a week tops and some weeks I go without them. So just keep that in mind when you're making your meal plan and you're going grocery shopping. Um, but if you do feel it's necessary to include soy in your diet, there are some guidelines you can follow. Um, one, be sure that you're not iodine deficient. This is tricky because you can only determine if you're deficient um, if you have, it's called an urinary iodine clearance test, and they talk about this in the article a little bit more. You also want to make sure you're not over supplementing iodine in your diet because this can trigger, trigger thyroid problems as well. So again, talk to your doctor, talk to a nutritionist about it. Um, these are areas that you don't want to mess around with if you're not an expert in the field, which I'm not. So I want to make sure you guys know these issues and can talk about them with your physician. And it says, if you have elevated thyroid antibodies or autoimmune thyroid disease that is not being treated, be aware that soy can be a trigger for developing hypothyroidism. If you are a thyroid patient with optimized thyroid treatment and you're still suffering from hypothyroidism symptoms, consider eliminating soy from your diet to see if it helps relieve your symptoms. If you're eating soy foods, you may want to avoid, avoid genetically modified soy, which I always recommend. Um, and it should say on the package if it's organic, non-GMO, tofu, or soy, it should say right on the package. And if it doesn't, then just assume that it is. And another key thing, make sure you're not taking soy and isoflavon supplements. You're already going to be getting more than enough of that just from the foods you eat. If you're taking a supplement in addition to eating the foods, you're going to be getting way, way too much soy in your diet. Um, the recommended amount, according to this article, is about 30 milligrams a day, which is roughly what um, people in Asia are getting in their diet, which is why they're not seeing these health problems that we are in America. In Asia, they treat it more as a condiment. They don't really treat it as like a main food source in their diet, which is why they're not seeing all these health problems that we are seeing. So think of it that way. Treat, a, treat soy like a condiment or a treat. Eat it in sparing amounts and you're going to be fine. Like you don't need to be afraid of soy products. You just need to be more aware about what the source of your soy, soy is, how much you're eating, and if you already have um, problems with iodine deficiency, thyroidism, any of those problems. You need to be aware of that. But if, if you're aware of these problems, limit the amount of soy you eat and really pay attention to your diet and make sure you're eating whole plant-based diet with nuts, produce, whole grains, not refined sugars and grains. You're going to be healthy and just fine. So don't, don't be afraid to eat a little bit of soy. So keep in mind, um, soy is one of the most common allergy triggering foods according to the article that I read. Um, so even if it's not affecting your thyroid specifically, it may be triggering symptoms of allergic response, which can include acne, swelling, stuffy nose, diarrhea, stomach pains, heart palpitations, skin rashes, itching, hives, swelling in the throat, fatigue, and episodes of low blood pressure. So um, if you're having health issues and you've been eating a lot of soy, maybe just try reducing or eliminating it from your diet and just see if your health improves. Really good brand of tofu that I enjoy, it's called Melissa's Tofu. It is um, non-GMO tofu, it's organic, so you don't have any of those issues. Um, you can, instead of maybe using the whole block, you could just crumble up half of it and just put more vegetables in your stir fry. Um, there's lots of ways you can limit your, the amount of soy. I am drinking rice milk instead of soy milk. Um, if I have soy milk, it's very occasionally. Um, I just I do this just to limit the amount of soy milk I'm drinking and the amount of soy products I eat. As far as soy-free faux cheeses, um, Daya is a good brand. They don't use any soy in their faux cheese, so um, if that is a concern for you, maybe just try that brand out. Um, but yeah, I hope this helps. I know it is a little complicated, but um, the key is just to remember, be aware of your current health situation, be aware if you have iodine deficiencies, be aware if you have um, hypothyroidism, if you have any problems with your thyroid, be aware of that, and always eat soy products in moderation.